Mesdames, Messieurs, bonsoir et rebonsoir à ceux et celles d'entre vous qui étaient déjà là hier soir pour la première soirée. Bienvenue, bienvenue à cette deuxième soirée du colloque Wright pour la science, dont c'est la 20e édition cette année. Après la première soirée très fréquentée d'hier soir, l'équipe de la Fondation Wright est évidemment très heureuse de, de vous retrouver si nombreux ce soir après une édition 2020 bien chahutée par le, le Covid, vous pouvez vous imaginer. Bienvenue aussi à toutes celles et ceux qui nous suivent en direct, en ligne. Mon nom est Olivier Dessibourg, je suis journaliste scientifique et c'est moi qui ai le, le plaisir, l'honneur, le privilège aussi euh, de vous accompagner toute cette semaine pour modérer ces discussions. Comme à chaque édition, vous le savez maintenant, nous avons le privilège d'accueillir ici à Genève, à l'Université des scientifiques de renom du monde entier. Cette année, pour arpenter avec eux le monde des géosciences, des sciences de la Terre, avec une thématique mythique, mythologique presque, les cinq éléments. Comme vous le savez, dans l'Antiquité, les Grecs, entre autres civilisations, se sont demandé s'il était possible de, de séparer tout objet de l'univers en, en quatre éléments primordiaux, l'eau, la terre, le feu et l'air. Chaque substance présente dans tout l'univers donc serait constituée d'un ou plusieurs de ces éléments en plus ou moins grande quantité. Et comme ça n'expliquait pas tout, un cinquième élément est venu se, se greffer sur ce tableau-là, considéré en plus. Euh, on l'a d'abord appelé la quintessence, puis l'éther, donc quelque chose qui portait, qui emplissait tout l'univers. Ce n'est que plus tard qu'est venue cette idée que le cinquième élément pouvait simplement être la vie. Alors chaque soir de cette semaine, nous n'allons pas étudier ou euh, regarder ces cinq éléments sous l'angle mythologique, bien sûr, mais euh, nous allons plutôt nous plonger dans les recherches de scientifiques de renom qui sont liés de près ou de loin à l'un des domaines qu'évoquent ces, ces éléments. De quoi vous apporter, d'ici la fin de la semaine, pour ceux qui nous suivent et ceux qui viennent d'autres soirs, une vision plus kaleidoscopique que vraiment panoramique sur notre environnement et plus largement sur notre planète. Alors, sur le plan logistique, comme vous le savez, cette conférence se déroule en deux parties. La première, une conférence, à peu près de 45 minutes, par le conférencier de ce soir, puis une seconde, où nous aurons le grand plaisir d'accueillir sur scène d'autres conférenciers de la semaine, c'est aussi une des richesses de ce, de ce colloque, pour une session de questions-réponses auxquelles vous êtes invités à participer directement, et en français ou en anglais, parce que vous avez dû recevoir un casque de, simulta... de, de, de traduction simultanée, français et anglais, donc n'hésitez pas à poser vos questions soit en anglais, parce que la discussion se fera en, en, en anglais avec les conférenciers, soit en français, et eux-mêmes pourront l'entendre le, le, euh, en anglais dans, dans leur casque. Après la Terre, hier donc, euh, nous poursuivons notre voyage géoscientifique euh, autour cette fois du feu, avec un périple autour des constructions géologiques les plus fascinantes, impressionnantes de la planète, les volcans. Et nous avons pour cela l'immense plaisir euh, d'accueillir ce soir Stephen Spark, qui est professeur émérite de volcanologie à l'Université de Bristol au Royaume-Uni. Et pour le présenter, comme c'est la tradition, ainsi que ses recherches, j'ai le plaisir d'inviter sur scène maintenant une personnalité de l'Université de Genève, en l'occurrence Costanza Bonadonna, professeure en volcanologie au département des sciences de la Terre de la Faculté des sciences de l'Université de Genève. Merci. Bonne Good evening, everybody. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce Professor Steve Sparks. With around 500 papers, several edited and co-authored books, and more than 55,000 citations, Professor Sparks is an internationally recognized expert in the fields of volcanology, igneous rocks, and risk associated with natural hazards. With this talk, he will address the element fire of this series of seminars, and we'll discuss the role of volcanoes in the context of a sustainable planet. Professor Sparks developed his initial interest in geology by exploring the caves of the British countryside, where he was fascinated by the fossils and minerals he discovered. He pursued his passion by completing his bachelor and PhD at the Imperial College. And it was at the beginning of his PhD that he sealed his interest in volcanoes thanks to a memorable expedition mapping volcanic rocks in southern Iceland. His seminal papers of the 70s and 80s represent a cornerstone of modern volcanology. 
For example, magma mixing, a mechanism for triggering acid explosive eruptions, published in Nature in 1977, showed how magma deep within the Earth could mix with material closer to the surface to trigger an explosive eruption. This idea has been very popular, and many scientists have referred to it to interpret data on volcanoes. Professor Sparks is actually currently working on this idea to further advance the understanding of how volcano and volcanic eruptions are triggered. After various positions in the UK at the University of Lancaster, University of Cambridge, and in the US at the University of Rhode Island, Professor Sparks arrived at the University of Bristol in 1989 as head of a newly reformed Department of Geology. Thanks to his vision and his enthusiasm, he built a world-leading center for volcanology and the earth sciences. But what probably most marked the scientific career of Professor Sparks was the eruption of Sophia Hills volcano on the overseas territory of Montserrat, where he was chosen to lead the monitoring effort and advise the British government. This eruption, which began in 1995, severely impacted the small Caribbean island and led to the permanent evacuation of over 12,000 people. This experience added a human dimension to his volcanological vision, which inspired him to pioneer methods for assessing the danger posed by volcanic eruptions, helping governments to improve decisions about evacuations and rebuilding. Thanks in part to his work, volcanic eruptions are now taught in British schools. In fact, a lot more could be said with the amazing work of Professor Sparks, and we could stay here for the whole night and longer. However, what I'd like you to appreciate most is the legacy of Professor Sparks. In terms of, of his influence on the field of volcanology, the earth sciences more generally, and of the students he has trained and inspired during his career, including myself. He was one of the first to apply mathematics and physics to the interpretation of volcanic deposits in the field, bringing volcanology into the modern era. He believes that important answers come from the field and from the understanding of physical processes. However, he also appreciates the insight provided by numerical modeling, in particular in the frame of risk reduction. Professor Sparks has a distinguished record service to the geological community, including presidency of the Geological Society of London, of the International Association of Volcanology and Chemistry of Earth's Interior, and of the Volcanology, Geochemistry, and Petrology section of the American Geophysical Union. His awards and honors are also outstanding, including the Geological Society of America's Arthur's Day Medal in 2000, the European Geoscience Union's Arthur Holmes Medal in 2004, the Royal Medal of the Royal Society of London in 2018, and the Knight Bachelor also in 2018. And finally, the Veteran Prize in 2015, which is considered as the Nobel Prize of our sciences. From a personal point of view, I had the great opportunity to get to know Professor Steve Sparks as an inspiring supervisor an amazing volcanologist in the field, a charismatic leader during the management of the Montserrat volcanic crisis, an enriching team player in any collaboration he has been involved in, a unique scientist with the capability of bridging the gap between multiple disciplines, and above all, an amazing person with an extraordinary sensitivity for both the personal and professional growth of his students, his colleagues, and his collaborators. This is why it is not just a pleasure, but an honor for me to introduce Professor Sparks to this prestigious audience this evening. Sir Stephen Sparks, the floor is yours. Thank you, well, thank you very much, uh, Costanza. It's a great pleasure to come here and uh, thank the Rant Foundation for the, uh, for the honor. So I'm going to talk tonight about volcanoes, and I'm, I've got sort of four integrated themes which we're going to go through. I'm going to firstly start off with the, the beauty and spectacle of volcanoes, uh, 
I'm then going to tell you something about why we have volcanoes on the Earth, what, what, um, what that tells us about the Earth, and then move on to, into the societal aspects of the nature of volcanic processes, and in particular hazards they pose to communities who live around volcanoes, and talk about the risk and management of uh, volcanic eruptions, uh, using the Soufre Hills volcano as my main example. And I'll finish off with a few words about the effects of volcanoes on climate. Well, this is, uh, to start with, I think we can all wonder at uh, the beauty of volcanoes. It's a, the great spectacles of nature. And it tells us that we live on a very dynamic planet. This is a picture of Krakatoa in 2018, when a new volcano uh, formed in the, on the center, or vent formed on the center. And uh, there's a picture of this same volcano, but from the, from the uh, space. And you'll see on the left-hand side, uh, what it looked like on 21st of December when it was erupting. And on the right-hand side, when it built up this uh, new vent, essentially that destabilized the island, and part of the island fell into the sea and formed a tsunami. So it gives you an example of the hazards. This is a volcano in Cordon Coyue. It's a, a, I think I've just chosen this because it's such a spectacular picture of lightning playing uh, as the volcanic explosion happens, all sorts of electrical charges are developed, and we very often get spectacular uh, uh, lightning. And finally, my, if you like, my volcano friends, um, this is the Hunga volcano in Tonga, which really uh, has surprised everyone in volcanology. It uh, erupted in January 2022, and this was a gigantic eruption incredibly energetic, about the most energetic volcanic event we've yet see, recorded on, on Earth. And this is a cloud about 500 kilometers in diameter from an explosion which probably only took a few tens of minutes. It's really quite amazing. And it's also got the world record of the highest volcanic cloud. It got up to 57 kilometers, almost got into the mesosphere. So I think those photographs introduce us to the spectacular character of volcanoes. And uh, just really to finish um, off this part, I'd like to have a look at the giant eruptions in Earth history. Um, when you get really big volcanic eruptions, they form enormous craters called calderas. And the very biggest eruptions that have happened in Earth history form these gigantic craters. We can look in the, uh, in the, the left on Pinatubo in 1991, which is pretty well the biggest eruption of the 20th century century, a one in a hundred year event, and it formed a very large crater erupting about five cubic kilometers of magma. We can look at the large, one of the largest, if not the largest eruption of the last thousand years on Earth, Tambora in 1815. More of that later, but that was uh, probably the largest uh, recorded eruption in science. It's um, formed a caldera or a crater six kilometers diameter and erupted 45 cubic kilometers. And then there's the big, uh, the biggest of them all is the giant Co uh, Toba caldera, which erupted 40, 74,000 years ago. It's a crater 100 kilometers by 30 kilometers. It's the biggest volcanic crater on Earth and uh, just about the biggest eruption we know about, erupting an incredible 2,800 cubic kilometers of magma, all in one go. And to give it a scale, I've put the Tambora caldera on the same scale inside the Toba caldera, just to get a, a sense of just how much bigger it was. Okay, so why do we have volcanoes at all on the Earth? And the basic reason is that the Earth is a very hot planet. If we go down to the center of the Earth, it's probably around 5,200 degrees centigrade. And something like 100 kilometers below Geneva is about 1,200 degrees centigrade. So inside the Earth, it gets very hot. We're on an extremely hot planet. And that's got significance because the material in the Earth is solid but it's so hot that it's close to melting. So it's fairly easy to change conditions and make the rocks deep in the earth melt, and therefore we get volcanoes. So that's the, uh, 
the reason we have volcanoes, and one of the characteristics of the Earth, why we get volcanoes, is that what we call plate tectonics is the main way of giving access to these deep, hot materials to near the Earth's surface. And most, not all, but most of the world's volcanoes are on the tectonic plates. And uh, I'm sure many of you will know about plate tectonics. If you look at the South Atlantic, we see the African plate pulling away uh, in the, on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and the South American plate splitting apart. And we get volcanoes all down the mid -o the ocean ridges. And then when the plates collide, as when the South American plate collides with the Nazca plate and we get the Andes lifted up, we also get lots of volcanoes. So most volcanoes are to do with plate tectonics. And so when we map out the world's volcanoes, known volcanoes, you'll see an enormous number around the ring of fire and in places like East Africa where the plates are pulling apart. You'll notice that these are the known volcanoes and they're mostly at where the plates are pushing together. And the reason you don't see many volcanoes mapped is, uh, on the ridges is because it's too deep and we don't know very much about them. So not many of them are mapped on the, uh, on the ocean ridges. But take a look at Iceland, load of volcanoes there. That's one of the, the few places on Earth where the tectonic plates, where the tectonic plates are pulled apart. It actually gets to uh, uh, above sea level, and we see lots and lots of volcanoes and people who can go down there and um, in submersibles and see them. Now, so this is the idea of the tectonic plates. You can see in the diagram, a sort of famous diagram that's reproduced in many different forms, but basically the plates pull apart at the ocean ridges, and one of the plates pushes back down into the earth um, at uh, where the plates collide. And you'll see, uh, I've got two, uh, in the yellow you'll see decompression, and uh, uh, around where the plates are pushing together you'll see uh, water released. And the point I want to make is you usually think of melting as heating things up, lighting a candle. But in the Earth, the two main mechanisms are reduction of pressure and adding water to the hot rocks of the interior, which makes them melt, which is the same thing as putting salt on the road in the winter to make the ice melt. So we're adding another substance which lowers the melting temperature. And so that's why we get volcanoes. Now, just to show you what, how wonderful uh, the science is now, uh, we can use seismic waves to make images, tomographic images, very like uh, medical procedures of scanning uh, 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 internal organs. And what you see are two wonderful images. On the uh, right-hand side, you'll see the East Pacific rise, and that's a tomographic image. It essentially, when seismic waves go through the Earth and they're hot and they've got melt present, the waves slow down, and if they go through cold rock, they go far, the seismic waves go faster, and you can calibrate that, and you can see at the East Pacific rise, one of the great ocean ridges, you can see the cold plates pulling away, but right in the center, it's really hot. There's a lot of melt there from the seismic imaging. And then in Japan, you can see uh, the plate going down. You can see that the plate itself is blue, where that big blue arrow is. You can even see earthquakes along the plate boundaries. Those little dots are the earthquakes that are actually defining where the plate is. And you can see above the plate, uh, there's little orangey-red areas. That's where the mantle above the plate is melting, and that's because we're adding water and making things melt. Now, uh, we talked um, from uh, Friedholm's talk last night about a being a blue planet, but inside it's a green planet. The main rock that makes up uh, the Earth's mantle is called peridotite. It's full of magnesium silicates, olivine, and it's a, as I mentioned, it's a solid rock. And the diagram you can see here is a diagram of pressure against temperature, and I've used a rather a technical term called here solidus. It's really the melting temperature, the, the word that we use for melting temperature of the rocks. Rocks don't melt at a single temperature. You heat them up and they get to a point where they get hot enough and a little bit of melt forms. And that temperature where a little bit of melt forms is called the solidus. And you can see something labeled the dry solidus against temperature. And you can see if I've got a green dot, that green dot 
Under normal conditions, the temperature's below the solid. In other words, it's not molten. But if we follow that green arrow and we go from where that green dot is at 100 kilometers to, say, 50 kilometers, we hit, by just changing the pressure, we hit the melting temperature and we start to melt and we get volcanoes. And then the other mechanism is that if we add a little bit of water to the Earth's interior, we can reduce the solidus, the point at which things melt, dramatically by hundreds of degrees centigrade. So we only add, need to add a bit of water and everything melts. And that's why we've got the ring of fire in the Pacific that provide that process. So that's really why we've got, we're, we've, we've got the interior. And we can look at the ridges. And just to look at this diagram, uh, I just want you to follow the arrows, which show the movement of the mantle as the plates move apart. You can see that the movement or the flow lines are moving away from the ocean ridges. And then the smaller arrows are showing where the little bits of melt that form as the pressure reduced, they flow to the axis of the ocean ridges and form volcanoes. And you can see in the green, the crystalline nature, what actually happens is when it starts to melt, little tiny droplets of melt form around all the little crystals. And that's shown on the, uh, the other side, the diagram here. And that melts as the plates move apart. It gets squeezed out, and it flows to the ocean ridge, and we get volcanoes. The other important thing happens at the ridge as well, because the volcanoes of the ocean ridges are underwater, mostly underwater. And what happens is the volcanoes on the ocean ridge form these rather bulbous-looking lava flows, very strange-looking things, and they heat up the seawater, and the seawater gets heated up to 350 degrees centigrade, and the rocks of the seafloor get hydrated. They form hydrous minerals, and those hydrous minerals are eventually going to be taken to the other side of the plate and pushed back down into the earth and release the water, which makes the, the mantle melt there, and we get more volcanoes in that environment. So it starts, actually, what happens in Mount St. Helens or wherever happens, starts at the mid-ocean ridge by seawater, because it's, we live in a wet planet. Just a few facts and figures about volcanoes. There have only been about 551 historically active volcanoes, but we know there's a lot more than that, which have yet to erupt historically. There's at least 1,500. Uh, and if we count all the ones on the ridges, there's probably more like 3,000. Roughly, there's 50 eruptions per year, some on the planet. You don't hear about many of them because they don't get the press attention. So it only, you only hear about them when they get into the newspapers and people are affected. And as I say, there's two aspects here. The one I'll talk about, these large eruptions affect climate. And the very important point is as the global population increases, and infrastructure and uh, development increase, the risk from, even though volcanoes are not increasing in time, the risk from volcanoes is increasing dramatically because of human development. Let's have a look at um, why we get explosions in volcanoes. I'm not going to go in much detail, but you see it's a sort of the champagne model, really. Magma deep, uh, perhaps several kilometers under the volcano, it has lots of gases dissolved in it. And when it comes up a, a to the volcanic vent, these gases bubble out, but they bubble out violently and produce great pressures which shatter the magma and erupt a jets of volcanic material into the, into the atmosphere with great violence. These flows can accelerate up to hundreds of meters per second. So that's basically why we get uh, volcanoes exploding. And I'm going to focus from now on mostly on explosive eruptions. Now, there's two sorts of phenomena that happen on volcanoes. And I'm going to show you a little bit of film first. But one, the formation of volcanic plumes. The volcano, the, uh, the, the bubbling breaks the magma apart. It jets out of the volcano, forms a great plume. And Mount St. Helens is shown there. It's just a sort of typical number. But that erupted at 10,000 cubic meters per second. I, my guess is. I wouldn't be surprised if this room's about 10,000 cubic meters. I'm just doing a guess, but it's certainly, uh, it, every, that's the amount it erupted per second, and it did so over several hours. 
You can see at the bottom um, an experiment. You can reproduce these in the lab by very simple experiments. This is a mixture of fresh water and very fine particles injected into a tank of salty water, and it rises up and forms a very similar structure. And we can learn about the physics from very simple laboratory experiments. But basically what happens is that ash, heat, very hot ash, heats the air that's dragged into the flow and makes it buoyant and go up to high levels in the atmosphere. So what I'm going to do now is uh, a little bit of interlude while I stop talking. Um, uh, about seven or eight years ago, I got funding from the World Bank to work with international colleagues in volcano observatories around the world. And to cut a long story short, we've produced 18 films for the general public in eight different languages. Uh, and fortunately, one of those is French. These are films for the public to explain how volcanoes work and their hazards. And you can d download these all for free on the web. And the website's shown there. It's called Volfilm. So I'm going to shut up now. Le magma est la roche en fusion sous les volcans. Il est riche en gaz qui se dilate quand il entre en éruption, comme les bulles d'une boisson gazeuse que l'on ouvre. Au cours des éruptions explosives, le magma et la roche solide volent en éclats. Des fragments de magma et de roche se forment. Leur taille varie de celle d'un grain de poussière à celle d'un bloc aussi grand qu'une voiture. Le matériel le plus fin, de la taille d'un grain de sable ou plus petit, est appelé « cendre volcanique ». Les fragments de roche éjectés de la bouche éruptive sont appelés « bombes volcaniques ». Les plus gros fragments retombent au sol proche du volcan où ils engendrent décès, blessures et dégâts. Ils peuvent traverser les toitures et mettre le feu aux bâtiments. La chute des fragments de roche plus petits fait le même bruit qu'un orage de grêle. D'immenses nuages de fragments de roches, de cendres et de gaz sont expulsés au-dessus des volcans pendant les éruptions explosives. Ces nuages volcaniques atteignent souvent plusieurs kilomètres d'altitude, voire des dizaines de kilomètres au niveau des altitudes de croisière des avions. Les nuages de cendres sont transportés par les vents sur des distances de plusieurs dizaines à plusieurs centaines de kilomètres. Leur vitesse de déplacement dépend de la vitesse du vent. Il peut faire nuit en plein jour car les épais nuages de cendres cachent le soleil. Tandis qu'ils sont transportés par le vent, les nuages volcaniques relâchent le matériel qu'ils contiennent. Ils retombent graduellement au sol, formant des dépôts épais à proximité des volcans, où terrains et bâtiments peuvent être entièrement recouverts. Les cendres sont transportées à de plus longues distances des volcans, formant des dépôts qui s'amincissent avec la distance. Les cendres les plus fines peuvent rester en suspension pendant des milliers de kilomètres. Les cendres volcaniques sont différentes de celles produites par le feu. Ce sont de petits fragments de roches anguleux, extrêmement rugueux et abrasifs, capables de rayer le pare-brise d'une voiture par exemple. Les cendres volcaniques sont dangereuses pour les humains, les animaux et l'environnement. Les terres sont recouvertes et les toitures peuvent s'effondrer. Les réseaux de transport, les ressources en eau, les systèmes d'assainissement, de communication et de production d'énergie peuvent être perturbés, les cultures détruites et le bétail tué. Au cours des petites éruptions, les cendres compliquent la vie quotidienne. Les scientifiques peuvent prédire l'évolution des nuages de cendres en étudiant les éruptions et les vents. Les autorités vous indiqueront quelles mesures prendre. Cela peut être l'évacuation des zones proches du volcan ou la protection de vos biens et de vous-même. Au cours du temps, les populations vivant à proximité de volcans entrant régulièrement en éruption peuvent développer des méthodes de gestion efficaces, leur permettant de vivre avec les aléas. Les cendres volcaniques peuvent améliorer la fertilité des terres. kind of activity that can, a volcano can do, which is even uh, uh, more hazardous than the first kind, is a phenomena which was called column collapse and formation of what are called pyroclastic flows. And the little experiment right at the bottom shows you how you can reproduce this in a very simple laboratory experiment. 
So instead of squirting fresh water and particles into salty water, we put so many suspended particles that the mixture is dense, even though the fresh water is buoyant in the salty water, the there's so many particles that the mixture is dense, and so rather than going up and forming a plume, it goes up a little way, and then it collapses, and then flows down the, uh, along the boundary of the, uh, the tank. And you can see uh, cuts, uh, some shots from Mount St. Helens of exactly the same phenomena happening uh, in uh, uh, real eruption. So this is the formation of pyroclastic flows, and these are responsible for many of the deaths that occur in volcanoes. And again, I'm going to show you a short film from our Vol film series uh, to illustrate these. Les écoulements pyroclastiques font partie des menaces volcaniques les plus mortelles. Ce sont des avalanches de roches très chaudes, de poussières et de gaz qui dévalent à grande vitesse les flancs d'un volcan et s'écoulent dans les vallées avoisinantes. Elles peuvent remonter sur la topographie et surmonter des crêtes. Ils sont dangereux car ils se propagent beaucoup plus vite qu'une personne en courant et souvent plus vite que la vitesse d'une voiture. Ainsi, ceux qui se trouvent sur leur chemin ont très peu de chances de leur échapper. C'est leur haute température qui les rend particulièrement mortels et dévastateurs. Pendant la journée, ils sont de couleur grise et d'une apparence poussiéreuse, mais la nuit, ils sont rouges d'incandescence. Ils détruisent et brûlent tout sur leur passage. Toute personne sur le chemin d'un écoulement pyroclastique est certaine de subir de graves blessures, voire de mourir. Les écoulements pyroclastiques peuvent se former de deux manières. Parfois, un volcan explose et forme une fontaine de roches pulvérisées incandescentes et de gaz qui, initialement, monte rapidement dans le ciel avant de retomber vers le sol en formant des écoulements pyroclastiques qui dévalent les flancs du volcan. Dans d'autres situations, au lieu d'avoir une explosion, c'est une lave visqueuse qui s'écoule lentement du volcan en s'accumulant au sommet. C'est l'effondrement partiel de cette masse de lave qui peut générer des écoulements pyroclastiques. Bien que les écoulements pyroclastiques s'épanchent normalement le long des vallées, les nuages extrêmement chauds et rapides qui se forment au-dessus d'eux peuvent déborder des vallées en remontant sur le côté et menacer les personnes qui se sentent en sécurité en hauteur. Les écoulements pyroclastiques se propagent en général sur des distances de 5 à 10 km du sommet du volcan, mais parfois au-delà de 20 km dans les plus grandes éruptions. Les volcans qui ne sont pas entrés en éruption depuis des décennies, voire des siècles, semblent bien paisibles. Cependant, lorsqu'ils se réveillent, leurs éruptions sont souvent très importantes et explosives. Les scientifiques peuvent détecter le réveil d'un volcan et sont capables d'émettre des alertes et des recommandations d'évacuer, ce qui constitue la seule protection face aux écoulements pyroclastiques. OK, well, that neatly introduces the next theme of my talk, which is about monitoring, forecasting, and risk assessment. So how can we apply the science, that we understanding of volcanoes, to uh, protect societies from their eruption? Now, it'd be very nice if we could forecast volcanic eruptions. Mostly, we can't very easily. It uh, takes a lot of work. But I just wanted to show you one example. Um, this is an explosion on the island of Montserrat. And what you're looking at is, on the vertical axis, is the frequency and time on the horizontal axis. And this is what we call continuous or volcanic tremor. Volcanoes, when they erupt, often shake around continuously. And what seismologists can do is they can look at the spectral frequency content of the, the seismic sound, if you like, And what you notice are these sort of gliding lines. What that's telling you is that the uh, frequency of a dominant, uh, there's a dominant frequency, and that's changing systematically about 20 minutes before an explosion. So this is an example of a pattern that we can observe. We might not understand it fully, but suggest, which may enable us to give a forecast or a prediction of a volcanic event. So this is a bit like the volcano, it's like a tune. It's sort of going and then explodes. And that's uh, what we're seeing in the seismic data. That's often not the that, uh, often it's not as quite as good as that. Um, but um, that's what we're looking at. We're looking for patterns in activity.
Now, before going on to talk about the monitoring and the risk forecasting, I'd just, uh, just mention a couple of huge uh, human tragedies that have happened because of volcanic eruptions and motivate our interest in applying the science in a, uh, to society's benefit. In 1902, there's a very famous eruption of Montpellier in Martinique. 29,000 people died when political priorities took precedence over public concerns. The Volk, a lot of people, some of the engineers and doctors in the town were worried about the volcano, but there was an election going on and the politicians decided they'd go ahead with elections before they'd evacuate, but unfortunately, uh, that didn't work out. And this is another example. This is Almero, a, a village, or a big town, actually, in uh, Colombia in 1985. And there, there was a volcanic eruption on a, a volcano called uh, Nevados del Ruiz, uh, which has an, an ice cap, and there was uh, some explosions on the ice cap and the hot material melted the ice, and therefore a huge flood of water and uh, melted ice and rocks poured into the town, and uh, 23,000 people were killed. So these are two examples of things we'd like to avoid. So I'm going to take you, as Costanza mentioned, to my, one of my favorite volcanoes, the Soufre Hills volcano in the Montserrat, which erupted for 15 years between 1995 and 2010. You can see the volcano the head of the island steaming away. This is where it is. It's in the northern part of the uh, eastern Caribbean on the island of Montserrat. The volcano is on the, uh, the, the southern end. And when the volcano started erupting, there were about 12,000 people on the island. And many of them had to leave the island uh, or go to the north. And I got involved uh, with many other people, including Costanza, in monitoring the volcano. Over the course of the eruptions, about 9,000 people were re re relocated. The bill came in at about a billion dollars from the eruption, and it's cost the UK uh, taxpayers about 30 million pounds per year ever since, in all, uh, because the volcano is still unstable. So this is a good example of what we can do with volcanoes. One of the things we do get on in volcanic eruptions, both before and during, are little earthquakes. And these earthquakes are largely telling us about magma, molten rock, trying to force its way to the surface and to erupt. And you can see we can get the depth of the earthquake, and we can map that out on the island, and we can look at the depth. And we can see here that there are many, many tiny little earthquakes that are happening from depth from the surface to about five kilometers depth. So we think that the source of the volcano is at around five kilometers. And we can use earthquakes in quite sophisticated ways to tell us what's going on inside the volcano. So earthquakes is a very primary way of monitoring the volcano. Another thing we can do by all sorts of methods, so that this is showing a laser electrodistance measuring, um, where one of the PhD students from Bristol is measuring very accurately a line from a reflector. Uh, and what uh, the, the measurements are trying to look at is the swelling of the ground um, underneath the volcano. When the pressure goes up before an eruption or during an eruption, the ground is lifted up, and there's what's called inflation. You can see that in the diagram. And you, by using these very precise instruments, you can use satellites too, you can measure this uh, uh, very precisely and you can see when the volcano is going up or going down, and you, basically you can use it as a pressure meter. And this just shows you that these things show systematic patterns. This is the activity. It's a very busy diagram. Uh, it shows you the whole eruption from 1995 to 2013. If you look at the pink stripes, that's when the volcano is erupting a lot, and the green areas are periods of repose where nothing much is happening. And if you look at the middle diagram, the red, there's a, a, a red line which is going across. These are the Jobel positioning set, uh, GPS coordinate uh, network showing the uplift and deflation of the ground, the uplift and substance of the ground. And you can see in the green periods, the ground's lifting up because the pressure inside the volcano is going up. And when it's erupting, the ground is going down. The, that red curve goes down again. So we can start to see patterns in the deformation. And you can see also the, the blue on the top are the number of earthquakes per day. 
And you can see there's definitely a lot more earthquakes when it's erupting than when it isn't. And so you can start to see patterns. And we can also, I'm not going to talk much about it, but we can measure volcanic gases. So we have uh, uh, data on volcanic gases at the bottom. So we can recognize patterns. We might not understand them fully, but we can recognize the patterns and use these to forecast and manage the crisis. So that leads me to volcanic risk management. Um, I want to put this map up. During the crisis, we divided the, or the, I shouldn't say we, because the scientists were providing advice, the government, it's a UK dependent territory, and the governor and the chief minister of the island were making the decisions. But this is the, basically the red area, you, nobody can live, and the yellow area is a place which is deemed to be low enough risk that people can live. And I just want to imagine that you're somebody with a house who's just 100 meters inside the red area, and you're forced to abandon your house for years and years and years, and the ne your neighbor is in the yellow just across the boundary, and they can stay and carry on living as they like. So you can imagine that is going to produce in a crowded island or any environment where you actually put the lines between it being safe and not safe as can be very societally contentious. So, uh, it, so that's a difficult thing to do. Well, how do we do it? We do something called probabilistic risk assessment, and it's um, basically the idea of getting a group of scientists around a committee and talking about the science, the models, the observations, uh, under, general understanding of volcanoes, and trying to answer questions like the, the following. What's the chance that a village six kilometers northwest of the volcano will be inundated by a paraclastic flow that you saw in the movies? So that's the sort of question we're trying to answer. Easy to pose, but not very difficult, to, uh, rather difficult to answer. And of course, if there are hundreds or tens of people living in the village, they really need to know whether there's a, the risk is high or not. Now, what goes into it is, in a sense, a synthesis of all the science we know, and just as important, the science we don't know, because we want to give the, uh, a sense of how confident we are when we make the risk assessment, what's the uncertainty. And that's really always a very important part of any risk assessment. It's what you don't know is just almost as important as what you do know. Now, in 2003, we were faced with the following problem. The volcano had been erupting a lot, and what you're seeing is a, an almost 1,100-meter high mound of 850 degrees centigrade lava sitting on top of the volcano. And this kind of situation is very unstable. Bits of it can fall off and form pyroclastic flow. And to the right, the place called the Upper Bellum Valley, there were a few hundred people living in small villages and towns, or sort of small villages and communities in that area. So we were being uh, asked to assess the risk that one of this, this lump would fall down this particular valley, rather than in the other valley, and go to these villages and threaten them. And here's the, the, the plan. You can see on the map the area. You can see the, where the volcano is. And you can see in that rather detailed map, you can see uh, the, um, the blue areas where the peop uh, people are really concerned about. Uh, so how did we do that? that we uh, gave them the advice that this, this area should be evacuated on the 8th of October 2002. And then we did our risk assessment. And the first thing I want you to look at is the map. It's a sort of, we divided the area up into areas with and, and looked at the populations living in each of these areas. And the area that we were particularly interested in was area four and three, where these people, where we thought pyroclastic flows could get to. And the red line, now this is something that insurers do all the time. The probability of a number of fatalities, this might be probability of financial loss, for an insurance company, but here we're looking at the probability of a number of people being killed against, on the horizontal axis, the number of people who would be killed. And the red curve was the curve we estimated given that we didn't evacuate this place. And that red curve enabled us to say there's a one in 10 chance of 
10 pe at least 10 people being killed and a 1 in 100 chance of well over, a, of, um, of sort of approaching several tens of people killed. So that's a very high risk situation. And we showed this sort of plot to the governor and the chief minister. They said, yes, we'll evacuate. But how far do we have to get people away from the volcano? And the two gray curves you can see is if we evacuate area three, uh, four and five, and then area 3A, the risk curve comes down. So we can essentially make it much less risky. And then you can see there's a blue curve and a green curve. The green curve, I think, is the earthquake risk in the Caribbean of death, and the hurricane curve is the death from a hurricane. So in other words, that comes down to a level of risk which is comparable to the risk people essentially t li uh, take by living on the uh, on the, in the Caribbean that there's a very small chance that they might be killed by an earthquake or a, a hurricane. So we could show by evacuating areas three and four, we were reducing the risk to that level. We weren't eliminating risk, we were reducing it. So that's basically how we did it. What actually happened? This is the 12th of July, 2003. A few months later, the people have been evacuated for a few months. Not, into, not all of them terribly happy. And then this happened. That enormous mound, remember it's 1,100 meters high. It's 200 cubic, million cubic meters of hot stuff. And that's what happened on the 13th of July. The whole lot fell into the sea and formed a tsunami. But it fell off into the east. It didn't fall towards the village. And we didn't know that. We, we thought this was the most likely thing to happen. And you can see that... Therefore, as soon as that had happened, the risk was reduced and the people could move back to the villages. So that's what uh, happened in that particular case. So I'm going to finish with just a few remarks about, we talked about this last night quite a lot, but um, about climate change and the impact of very large eruptions on climate. And this is something I think uh, is of concern because it's a sort of threat on a regional and global scale. When you get one of these huge eruptions, it puts up a whole pile of dust and gas into the atmosphere. And in particular, sulfur dioxide goes up into the stratosphere and reacts with water and forms sulfuric acid. And this forms droplets in the, the uh, atmosphere, which essentially scatter back the solar radiation. So the effect of a very large eruption is global cooling. Now, it's not quite as simple as cooling. Obviously, near the surface, the su the, some of the sunlight is prevented from getting to, the, uh, uh, to near the Earth's surface. So the, the surface there, the troposphere, cools. But actually, the stratosphere heats up because some of that solar radiation heats up, is heated up the little aerosol droplets. They absorb the heat. And so we actually heat up the uh, stratosphere and that affects, particularly if you have a tropical eruption, it affects the whole global circulation. And so we get weird climate effects for a few years after one of these big eruptions. So that's the one we're interested in. We had um, a good example of this in Pinatubo in 1991. The red shows you the outline of the Philippines, and you can see a sort of 400-kilometer diameter cloud injected into the stratosphere. And on the top left, you can see an infrared image of that huge cloud. And in the bottom, you can see a satellite image of where all the sulfur dioxide has gone. And in three weeks from this eruption, sulfur dioxide encircled the whole globe. And then over the following year or two, the circulation of the Earth, of what's called the Hadley cells, brought those aerosols to the poles and essentially polluted the whole atmosphere. And so we got the uh, expected effects of global cooling. So it, these big eruptions produce atmospheric pollution on a global scale. Now, I just thought I'd show you this because it shows you volcanology, in a way, has some broad interest for climate. This is one of the few occasions where nature does a gigantic experiment. It shoots up a lot of muck into the stratosphere, and then it affects the heating of the Earth, and we can test global climate models. 
Now, these are, of course, compared to today, fairly primitive numerical models. But what I want you to see is that if you look at the top map, where you're seeing it a bit orangey, um, it's basically warmer than it should be. And where you're seeing it's blue, it's um, uh, colder than it should be. So this is the perturbation map from Pinatubo. These are the observations. And on the bottom, you can see a numerical model, a global climate model, uh, with the same inputs of aerosols. And not, it's not a one-to-one -one match by any means, but basically the, the similar pattern emerges. And uh, you get some very odd effects. Uh, you can see, for example, the, uh, particularly on the, the, mod the modeling side, that the east of uh, the United States gets uh, pretty much colder in summer. In 1815, the eruption of Tambora did something like this. I've mentioned this before. And there was the Great Famine of 1816. In fact, I'll just read out the coldest summer in 1753 to 1960 in Geneva, Switzerland. And you can also see in it the estimated temperature in 1816, where the temperature dropped by one and a half to two degrees globally. And you can see it took quite a few years to recover. So these big eruptions have big effects. And you can see in the price of wheat that in the 1816, which was a terrible year for the harvest, uh, the wheat price tripled because of the eruption, mostly in the eastern United States. So an eruption in Indonesia had a created frosts and snow throughout the summer of 1816, ruining the crops, and therefore the wheat price went up. So pretty dramatic um, effects. And this is the final slide. Uh, what happens if we get a super eruption, one of these, something like Toba, which is vastly bigger than, uh, than um, uh, Tambora? I mentioned it was 74,000 years ago, formed the biggest crater on Earth. And we think we might have found it in ice cores in Antarctica. Whenever one of these big eruptions happen, all the sulfuric acid goes to the poles, the aerosol gets deposited there, and it forms a layer, and you can measure this in the ice cores. And this is the plot of the sulfate in the ice core from Antarctica. Um, and don't worry about the reading too much, except that this is about 50 times bigger than Tambora, uh, than Tambora in 18. Uh, the, the same signal of Tambora in 1815. So, and it's about the right time for Toba. So we get an enormous signal. Now, we can, from that ice core data, we can put that into models, which the Met Office in the UK have done, and we can see what happens. Um, and it doesn't look terribly good. Um, they, basically, we get temperatures down to minus 15, minus 10 below normal for several years, perhaps a few, maybe a decade or two. And you'll also notice, paradoxically, in the models, the poles actually heat up. And that's because of the heating of the stratosphere and the, so essentially the transport of heat to the polar regions that are caused by the perturbed climate. So it's a very interesting area of, uh, of um, research uh, and uh, concerns us about uh, what would happen with a really gigantic eruption of this kind. Don't worry, they probably happen every 50,000 years or so, so we needn't worry too much. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, take a seat, and as said, we now have the great pleasure, because it's the richness of this uh, colloquium right pour la science, to welcome on stage further speakers of the, of the colloquium uh, to have a discussion all together. So I have the great pleasure tonight to, inv uh, to invite uh, last evening speakers, Friedhelm von Blankenburg. I look at them, Nick Lane, who's going to speak on Friday, and Ilke Fer uh, as well. I'll present them in a second. Please uh, take a seat. So as said, um, we'll have now a Q&A. So question and answer session, I will ask asking, uh, I'll start asking some, some questions and then open the floor to, to questions. If you're interested, there are two microphones uh, 
let's say, walking around. So uh, please raise your hand, and I'll, I'll give you the, the, the word. And if you are listening or watching online, you can also ask questions online through the chat system that is uh, um, uh, with the live stream, and they will be relayed on stage uh, tonight with us. So let me turn to, to you, our three uh, additional guests. And maybe I'll start with you, uh, Friedhelm. You were here yesterday. <laughs> Uh, without redoing your talk, uh, you're a professor of uh, geology, geochemistry uh, in Germany, in Potsdam. What is the link of your research, if you had to tell in, in very few words, um, um, with the volcano? Um, they emit lots of gases which affect um, uh, atmospheric composition, which um, affects uh, the chemical decomposition of the Earth's surface. On the other hand, if there wouldn't be any volcanoes, we wouldn't even have any proper Earth's surface. So they are incredibly beneficial for keeping everything going. Besides the hazards, I would say the benefits by far outweigh the hazards on the long time perspective. Ilker, uh, you're an oceanograph. You're going to be speaking tomorrow evening. Uh, what, what is the link to your research? We can, and you, you're studying the dynamics of oceans, if you can sum it up. Uh, what, what is the link uh, uh, to your research with volcanoes? Correct. Thank you. It, it was a great talk. Uh, I can draw many parallels. Maybe the most important, I would uh, point to the uh, ocean ridges. Uh, the, the ocean circulation follows topography, the bathymetry of the ocean. It's very highly constrained with the Earth's rotation and the bathymetry. So the mid-ocean ridges, Steve presented, it controls how the ocean circulates. And there's much more. <laughs> I'll stop so there. let's talk about uh, underwater volcanoes with UNIC. Uh, you're a professor of uh, biochemistry at UCL in London. You're going to speak on Friday on the origins of life. So this, this big theory that life <laughs> originated uh, close to underwater volcano. Well, not actually volcanoes, funnily enough, so not the black smoker vents. Uh, well, I don't think so anyway, um, that, that Stephen was talking about. But he talked about the, um, the, the green planet underneath, olivine, uh, as a mineral. Uh, and, and olivine will react with water and become hydrated, as he said. And now that reaction itself uh, releases heat and produces a different kind of hydrothermal vent, which has been associated with the origin of life uh, by Mike Russell in particular. Um, and these really, the, the, you'd find these vents, they're called alkaline hydrothermal vents, and you find them on any wet rocky planet, or at least we would predict to find them on any wet rocky planet. And what they have that I love as a biochemist is that um, we have alkaline fluids going into what would have been an acidic early ocean with a lot of CO2 degassing from the volcanoes. Um, and so we, we have a structure which is given to us free, which is a cell-like structure. It's a kind of a labyrinth of pores in these rocks. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and differences in pH or proton concentration between one side and the other side, which is exactly the same topology as cells. So I'm not a geologist at all, uh, but if I want to understand the origin of life, I have to uh, get involved in geology and talk to geologists a lot of the time. It's one of the great things about science you'd never guess. So we'll talk about this on, on Friday. Maybe two short questions, comprehension questions. And one is related to a story of my family. We were lucky to be on Stromboli last, last year for the, the holidays. And you, you might know that this uh, volcano has the particularity to, to erupt every 20 minutes or so. So I was a big star that day because I could predict to my kids that the, <laughs> the volcano could actually erupt. I told them, it's coming in, in five minutes, and then it erupted, so I was... A, Star. You didn't mention why s some volcanoes do erupt so regularly, knowing that, for example, Etna is just a few kilometers away, and we don't know when Etna will erupt. So what, technically, what is yeah. the, the difference? Okay. Oh, you, can, you have your mind. Oh, yes, I've got them. Yes, well, the, uh, there's some volcanoes where the flux of magma to the surface is sufficiently high that the pipe gets warmed up, and the introduction of heat is greater than the loss of heat, and so this pipe eventually develops into a continuous pathway up which magma can move and erupt continuously, and you get a volcano like Stromboli. Uh, 
Most volcanoes aren't like that. You've mentioned Etna's like that. There are, quite, there are some around the world, but most of them behave in a very different way. They erupt violently or erupt, and then they go to sleep for often years or even decades or even centuries, even millennia, and then erupt again. That's the commoner kind of activity. And in those cases, the magmas come up. It's erupted, but it hasn't warmed the pathway enough. It hasn't uh, brought in enough heat. So the pathway gets frozen again, and the magma's stuck down there and has to sort of brew up for quite a while before it can erupt again. Well, I hope my kids don't listen to that explanation because <laughs> then I'm not the star anymore. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, uh, no, next question uh, also for you, uh, Steve. You were mentioning this, this prediction of risks, right? Mm. And in 21, we had this eruption of the Niragongo. Mm -hmm which was totally unexpected. We didn't, you didn't, volcanologists didn't see it come at all, right? Mm -hmm. So what does it tell about the efficiency of the surveillance uh, uh, tools and methods that you've put in place over the years? It, it's, a, it's a tough question because volcanoes, um, I, I shouldn't uh, anthropomorphize them too much, but each volcano, it's got its own personality and style and character. No one volcano is like another. And some are, particularly in the developed world, very well monitored, a lot of scientific attention. And so a lot is understood, and the patterns that I talked about are beginning to get recognized. In the developing world, a lot of the volcanoes are really not well surveyed or not surveyed at all. And uh, so they don't really have the sort of the, the technical capacity to make the forecasts. So I think that's a, that's a problem that, um, and uh, I think there is a lot of help done by the, develop, uh, the developing world supporting volcano observatories in countries like Indonesia and Guatemala and so forth. But it, it, notwithstanding that, uh, that, there's not so much known about those volcanoes and they're not as well monitored. And Niragonga, of course, is in a place where there's essentially been a civil war and refugees and it's a pretty difficult place to do any science you know to do science well even though the the goma volcano observatory is really quite well staffed by very capable people they haven't got the the equipment and last question for me um related to the risks issue that you that you mentioned and it's also, also uh, actually for for the three of you um with risks goes un uncertainties how difficult is it to communicate that risk? Uh, what is your experience to the maybe politicians or decision makers? And the same questions to you all. How is it in your fields of research, be that on CO2 absorption, on the origins of life, or on the oceans, uh, uh, circulations, uh, the dynamics of the oceans, mm -hmm. communicating that uncertainty? Maybe yes. starting with you, Stephen, then uh, we'll go. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's really quite a significant challenge because a lot of areas of natural science and natural science hazard are very uncertain, partly because we don't understand the science or we don't have enough data or the models aren't well enough developed, all sorts of reasons where the, the uncertainties are very large. And community, communicating that to, um, the, um, to decision makers is, is challenging. And this, that happened in co that's happened in COVID response as, as well, so very similar things happen. Um, I think the, the, the best way is that you can, you can give very broad bounds of things which are likely, very likely, not very likely, and try and give the numbers, map that onto sort of words. But even that's challenging because some people may, what's very unlikely for what one circumstance may not be very unlikely in another circumstance, even though it's the same probability. So it's a, it's a, big, it's a challenging area, um, and I think the only thing you can do is talk and explain to the politicians and the decision makers in, uh, and, and educate them in, the, uh, in, in areas of probability and risk, quantitative risk assessment. Um, but they do keep changing the politician, don't they? I mean, Britain, we certainly have <laughs> noticed that recently. Um, so um, it's, um, it's quite difficult. You've, you've, you've basically 
talk to a civil servant or a, a politician and you think they're starting to understand about volcanoes and then they're off somewhere else and somebody new comes in. So it's, um, that, that can be challenging. Any comment from you? Yeah, Elker? I, I think it's a great question. I th one of the most challenging things for the scientists to put uncertainties in risks and predictions. And I could point to, for example, the IPCC approach. It has been a pain uh, to communicate the risks, and they ended up with definitions like highly likely, very highly likely, most likely kind of quantifications to communicate to pol uh, policymakers. So if you ask a scientist, he will never, he will, <laughs> he will never be sure. He says there's always some uncertainty. There's always, he can't conclude. But now we're getting tighter and tighter to be more decisive and conclude on, on the results. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah I mean, but I, was, I, I found the most fascinating part of your excellent talk, the, the, the Zufria uh, volcano, where, where just you, you showed us all these villages on, on, the, on the crest where you expected the, the, the ash flow to come down. So, oops. So humans appear to make their own risk assessment, and, and how do they do this? I mean, there must be, be larger benefits to live in the risk area of a volcano than, than the risk that you, that you might face. So, so how, does, how do individuals make that decision to move there and to stay there, and their kids also stay there, or they leave? Is, is that an example? On, are volcanoes an example of how humans make risky decisions, actually? Maybe an answer, and then we'll come to you. Yeah. Uh, yes, um, I mean, uh, it's a long time since I read it, but I read some work by psychologists, and they gave the sort of, um, the, if you like, the half-life of people feeling threatened by something as a few weeks. So if you're in a, a, a risky weeks. situation where you really are very frightened about something, it, uh, a community is very frightened, it seems to take a few weeks for them to get used to the risk and understand the risk and sort of get, feel more comfortable with it. So, um, and, and of course individuals, as Friedholm said, um, uh, take very different views of risk. Some people might be quite happy to carry on living because their business is there or their farm's there and carry on living uh, in very dangerous areas. And then you get into issues of freedom, can they can the government put a stop to them living in a dangerous place? There's some very interesting issues that arise out of human behavior. And a lot of the deaths, of course, and injuries will sometimes be for people who, who are, sort of, uh, are willing to accept a lot of risk. I vaguely recall Frederick Nietzsche recommend that everyone should live on the flanks of a volcano because it makes you feel more alive <laughs> for, for a little while anyway. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't do anything that really involves risk in any way, working on the origin of life, apart from risk to reputation. Um, <laughs> but yes, we don't know. I mean, it's, it's a great way of highlighting that science is often not really about what we know so much as what we don't know. And a subject like the origin of life, we don't know almost everything about it, uh, but we do know some things. And, and then science becomes the way of exploring the unknown and trying to piece together really a framework, a hypothesis, a set of predictions that can be tested. Um, and I think, uh, I mean, so much of the anger that we had in society about COVID, about the climate emergency and so on, boils down to how science is taught in schools and how the, the population as a whole really understands what risk is and what science is um, and, and what scientists do and do not know. And I, I think most people, understandably as humans do not like being preached at by experts who seem to know better and, and and so this idea of what is an expert and what is risk and what do we know and what don't we know it's really difficult to get across it's really difficult to explain that we often don't know the answers but still expertise is worth something um, and it, you know it's it, it's, a, it's a strange balance and and uh, I do feel that as a society we have to try to get across much better in many respects, the excitement of science, the excitement of exploring the unknown and trying to understand things that are, 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 are big, <laughs> a lot bigger than us. So I think it's time to open the floor for questions. Are there questions in the room? I see one there. Can I have some more light, please? Yes. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Sparks, thank you for an excellent presentation. I'm particularly proud for you being here because I did my doctorate at Bristol. Um, but my question is perhaps rather um, uninterestingly, not sociological, it's not philosophical about science, but it's very technical. You clearly made the connection between tectonic plates and volcanic activity. Um, and actually I'm cheating because I don't have just one question, I have three. The, the first is, why are they tectonic? What, why are they called tectonic? What does the word tectonic mean? The second is, why are they plates and not just aggregates? And the third, which is really seeking root cause for volcanic activity, is why do they move? Ah, right, okay. You, you have your... okay. Oh, yes, uh, if you've got a spare hour, I can, <laughs> I can, I can, I can probably do my best to address this. Uh, I think the point about tectonic is that the outer skin of the Earth, the lithosphere, is cold and brittle. The very outer parts are cold and brittle, and it breaks when you put enough stress on it, either pull it apart or push it together. And so it breaks, and those processes of breaks, I guess, are breaking up the very near surface of the Earth is what people, where the origin of the word tectonics. Um, why it isn't a sort of granular material, I would say, is because it... Um, it, the, the nature of the crystalline matrix is such that the deformation mechanisms are related to things like diffusion of molecules under high temperature, and it's not like it's not like pulling apart sand, which doesn't pull apart very well. It's um, it was, it's a continuous material which interacts on a molecular scale. So I don't so I don't think a granular model is a particularly good way of, of uh, characterizing most of Earth materials. And I can't remember the third one, but is... Why do they move? Oh, why do they move, yes. Well, it's the, the simply that a plate, when it's about 30 million years old, becomes denser than the hot rocks underneath, and so wants to sink. And any sort of perturbation on the Earth's surface that makes it sink a little bit will make it sink more, and then it's a runaway process. So subduction is really the fact that by the time the plate's more than 30 million years old, it's denser and wants to sink. So it's all gravity? It's largely, yes, largely gravity, um, but acting on temperature, you know, controlled by things like temperature and changes in mineralogy and chemistry and so forth. But, um, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. We have a question online. Actually, we have quite a few questions online. Um, so we can start with this one. So um, what is the probability of having a super eruption in the next few years? And if that happens, uh, would that be beneficial for the current climatic situation and climatic crisis? Uh, yeah. Okay, the, the stats of it are that um, super eruptions probably happen by the way, just to say, super eruptions got a totally arbitrary definition, which is any eruption more than 400 cubic kilometers of stuff in one eruption. That's its t uh, scientific definition. And that one, there's roughly one of those every 20,000 years. There have been four around the planet in the last 100,000 years. Uh, and um, so that's the frequency. So, I mean, crudely, it's not exact statistics, but I mean, you... If you think you would, it's sort of 30, your chances of being alive if you live for 70 years in something which happens every 20,000 years is not very great. It's the, it would be roughly 30 over 20,000. So, so most, if, it's pretty unlikely anybody in this audience will experience a super eruption. If one happened, um, I think my, my feeling is global warming might be, um, it might be sort of comparable in its threat to global warming. It, it's, of course, it's a fast threat rather than global warming is a slow threat. And I think that it's the slowness of global warming relative to human time scales, which is making it a challenging thing to deal with. Uh, but as you say, as I showed, the, the planet looks, it looks like the planet would get pretty cold. And so no food, darkness, for quite a long time, 
um, it, wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a great pl planet to live on for, for, during that period. And the second question? Yep, there's another question saying, what is the ratio between volcanic gas emission and the gas associated with human activity? Ooh. I th two, two is much, much bigger, isn't it? And Friedholm might be the best person to answer this with CO2. CO2 is 0.1 billion tons volcanic emissions and human emissions are now about 10 billion tons CO2. Yes. You, I, I'd like to bring now in the discussion a, a, a topic that was briefly mentioned yesterday. Um, it's geoengineering. You mentioned the Pina Tubo uh, in 91 which is the example of uh, the, the, the geoengineering IDs that, uh, that are around. And the idea is simple, is to reproduce artificially the Pinatubo eruption that uh, Steve uh, has uh, mentioned um, by just putting a lot of uh, uh, sulfuric acid in, uh, in, uh, in, in the air. I'd like to hear from you. We heard from you yesterday because you were the, the speaker, but what is your your view on, on geoengineering. Is that something that must be taken into account, even research now? Uh, and I'm it, sure all of the, the speakers will have something to say yeah, as well. I think it, we should be extremely wary about geoengineering because we don't understand the system well enough to know there aren't going to be unintended consequences. I think if you'd ask the people living in Connecticut and Massachusetts whether an eruption in Indonesia would uh, basically ruin their crops in 1816 and make them all move to Ohio uh, and essentially leave New England a barren area for, for actually decades. Uh, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the atmosphere and the ocean are the complex systems and we don't know whether um, uh, doing some engineering, putting some sort of, stuff up there, what, what the effect will, what the unintended effects will be. We don't know whether it will rain more or less in certain areas, will there be more droughts, less droughts, more hurricanes, less hurricanes. It, it's, uh, it's not really well known. Um, but we know the positive effects. I mean, you showed the positive effects of uh, well, the Pinatubo uh, eruption. Uh, well, it, the, the, there'd be positive effects for some people and negative, very negative effects for others if, if, if the eruption leads to more hurricanes in particular. And, and, and still, the IP, IPCC doesn't close the door. I mean, in the last report, yeah. they, they don't yeah. exclude that possibility. So I don't know if yeah. some, of, I, I, yes. some of you wants to comment. Uh, I mean, I, I, this is not something I work on at all or think about much, but my own emotional reaction is rather similar to yours. I don't know that we know the system well enough to be very secure in, in trying to alter it. I read a book, though, by Oliver Morton about geoengineering, um, and I, I, I started out reading it with, with, that, with that feeling that this is hubristic and is not something we should be doing because whenever we meddle with it, this is the theme of disaster movies. He persuaded me quite early on in the book that we are already geoengineering on a huge scale with the nitrogen cycle, for example, without actually thinking about it or planning it or doing anything. So he changed my mind somewhat from a, this is a hubristic idea to we're already doing it without even thinking about it, so we ought to at least think about it seriously. I still would be reluctant to take that as a kind of first measure, but I certainly don't think we should exclude it. You want to comment? Well, <clears throat> I gave my comment on this yesterday, in, in particular in, in terms of aerosol uh, to injection in the stratosphere, and like Mount Pinatuba has done for global cooling, I have, there's all sorts of moral issues involved, which you sort of mentioned. When you, one thing is you, you can do this for a time and, and you cool the area beneath it, but then at some stage you, you abandon those measures. Uh, by that time, global warming has increased and you get a super fast, super hot pulse uh, for the area that was previously cooled. And, and if, if we know how societies work, uh, they're probably not going to do ge geoengineering for the next 300 years, but maybe for the next three years, with luck for the next 30 years. But that, what happens after, after the, the discontinuation of any aerosol uh, dispersal? And, and these are things that, even, even beyond the scientific point of view, we don't think those through. So I, I'm very skeptical, I must say. <laughs> 
Are there further questions? Yeah, there's one up there and then here. So up there, please. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go on. Go on. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So Steve was showing in the, one of his last slides the, the effect in the Arctic Ocean, how this enormous um, uh, eruption affected that. So we have to get the teleconnections correct. We have to understand what's going on. If you impact so much, induce so much geoengineering, what will be the consequences on the large picture? Uh, the model results clearly show we don't, we don't know it good enough to attempt such a... Yeah, such an engineering. Yes? Um, yeah, thank you very much for the, for the discussion and the whole presentation. I wanted to ask about the very first eruption of a volcano. When, you, when the volcano erupts for the first time, is there already this mountain shape? Because I would guess that if there is already this mountain shape, there would be a bigger slice of mantle and it would be more difficult to have an eruption here. Is, is it that way or how does it work actually? Yes, it's a, it's a great question because what does a, a new volcano, a brand new volcano look like? Um, and we assume that it starts out as a small, possibly as quite a small event or a single eruption and that happens in one place and then goes back to sleep, and then there's another one, and then another one, and another one. It sort of builds up with time, and then eventually you end up with a big, big you know, big, uh, a big mountain. Um, but, um, I, I mean, the analogy would be in, or to give you an example, in 1947, I think it was, there was a farmer from, uh, in uh, central Mexico, and... Um, there had never been a volcano anywhere around or very close to where the, the farm was. And uh, saw a crack opening up in the field and out popped uh, Mount Perucatine, which erupted between 1947 and 1953 and formed really quite a, a, a big new volcano in a place which had had volcanoes before. So there's always got to be a first one. And um, uh, it's... Yes, I mean, it's... Um, it, as I say, once you start breaking up and creating the pathways, each time you've broken it up, you, it makes it a bit easier for more to come along later. Yes, thank you. Um, are there patterns, <clears throat> sorry, historical patterns to volcanic activity? Historically, was it different than it is today? Is it increasing, decreasing? And what about human civilization? Is, is there been... Is it noticeable that human civilization has impacted or influenced volcanic activity? Thank you. So, yeah, so um, first one on the, 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 as far as we know, and that by and large, volcanism has been the same for hundreds of thousands of years. We've got cores in Antarctica, core I showed in Antarctica. We've looked at every single sulfate layer and we've looked about the rates of deposition of sulfate from big eruptions has increased or decreased or is some way connected to climate cycles, and we found that it isn't. It's just steady. So, and the historical record suggests the same. We've got a bit of a problem that as you go back in time, you, the, the recordings are, better, are poorer, so it appears that there are less eruptions back in time, but that's just a, a recording issue. And uh, the second... Yes, yes, I mean, um, there's some nice, um, well, I'm not sure nice, but there's some in very interesting stories about various civilizations like the Mayans and the Minoans in, from the eruption of Santorini in Greece and, Mino and the Mayans from eruptions in Central America being affected by big volcanic eruptions. But the other way around, can civilization affect volcanoes? Not as far as we know, um, we talked yesterday about one phenomena, which definitely is when when there's a deglaciation and the ice caps melt. Yesterday, we with Friedhelm's talk, we talked about that actually what happens then is the ice loading on the Earth's mantle decreases and the mantle rebounds, and we get more melting than usual, and we get more volcanism than usual. So melting ice caps. Uh, 
from by natural or by, un, as we are at the moment, by unnatural anthropogenic effects is affecting, may well affect volcanism. We have a question there. Yes, please. Bonjour. J'aimerais vous poser une question. Uh, Est-ce qu'un cyclone, uh, est qu volcan peut créer un cyclone Et comment Oh, very, that's an excellent question. I'm not sure I know the answer to that one. Um, the, it's, I mean, they're formed by different sorts of mechanisms. Um, hurricanes and typhoons and things are formed by sea surface, are believed to be associated with sea surface temperature going up above some degree, I think it's 26 degrees or something like that. Then those are sort of conditions to prime hurricanes. And whether a volcano would affect things enough to, to cause a hurricane, um, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's definitely no, but I'm not sure what the mechanism would be. It's just worth pointing out that Pinatou, when Pinatou bow eruption, when I showed you the slides from the satellites and so forth, there was actually a typhoon coming into the Philippines at the time and the volcanic cloud completely dwarfed the, the typhoon. So uh, the, some eruptions like Pinatoba are actually much, you know, much bigger systems than, uh, than even big typhoons. So time is running. I'll take two questions, from uh, one from the uh, online audience and one from the room. Let's start with the on online audience. Uh, there's a double question online. That I Go on. I hope that counts. So can we exploit volcanoes as source of energy? And can we also modulate the energy of volcanoes? OK. Um, well, the first one is, yes, uh, geothermal energy is an enormous reservoir of, of uh, energy that we could exploit. It runs into some problems because the technology is such that um, it has to drill into rocks with very corrosive fluids often. Um, and so this makes it quite difficult, but there are geothermal plants in Japan and uh, Italy um, extracting volcanic heat. So it is an enormous uh, source of, um, of energy. I should just mention something else because it's something I'm actually interested in, involved in research at the moment. The other interesting things that underneath volcanoes, you when the gas comes out, it leaves behind brines. And these brines are full of, uh, can be imaged underneath vol many volcanoes. And they're likely full of interesting metals like lithium and copper and zinc and so forth, um, which are very interesting to the um, uh, to, to us, because we need all that. We need huge quantities of metals if we're going to drive around in electric cars and get to net zero. And so there is an, actually a, a possible source of metals, st strategic metals, underneath volcanoes in the form of brines. So it's another element. And of course, if you extract the brines, you can also extract the heat and drive geothermal energy. Last question there, please. Yes, good evening. I'd like to ask a question concerning the January eruption of Hunga Tonga. Are we seeing any effects um, only now 10, 11 months later? Uh, there were not many climate effects from that eruption, partly because it was quite short-lived. So although it was a very violent, it, um, the amount of material it was short, so it didn't erupt an enormous amount, quite a lot of stuff. But it was also in the sea, and it looks like there wasn't much sulfur dark side, as you'd expect from an eruption of that size. And whether that's because this particular volcano doesn't have much sulfur, or the sulfur all interacted with seawater and never got up into the sky because it, 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 it was a very wet eruption being in the ocean, I don't know. But it, it hasn't had a big, it hasn't had a, 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 a I'm, I'm not sure I've kept up with all the research on it, but I don't, I haven't heard anyone say that there was a, any big climate effect. So we run out of time, but I'll dare ask a, a last question to you with your lifelong experience. What would be the most fantastic discovery to be made on volcanoes as of today? Oh, that's a, 
Yeah, that's, a cha- that's a challenging one. I, I, uh, I mean, the, the one thing that we, we need is methods of measuring things better underground. And perhaps technology will come to our rescue somehow. I mean, magnetotelluric profiles or, uh, through volcanoes are turning up very interesting uh, information. So I think what I put it as a challenge, the challenge is that the things that are interesting are going on at 10, 20, 30 kilometers depth. Now, all the little earthquakes that are happening in the top few kilometers are interesting, but the real action is taking place much deeper where you don't really get earthquakes because the rocks are all ductile and they're not breaking apart so much. And there are subtle signatures, and it could be that um, uh, there's some new technology which allows us to make measurements in regions that we can't at the moment. And I, so I, th- I think it was, my, my answer would be sort of technological breakthrough which allowed better measurements. So that's a nice wish and a beautiful conclusion for the, mm. for the panel. Mm. Thank you very much to the four of you. Thank you. Voilà. Il me reste aussi à remercier chaleureusement toutes les personnes qui ont contribué à organiser euh, ce, ce colloque Ride cette semaine. Je ne vais pas les citer ici, euh, elles se reconnaîtront. Merci à elles, merci aussi, on ne les cite pas assez souvent aux interprètes qui vous font euh, les euh, traductions simultanées. Deux informations encore, trois plutôt. La première, c'est que demain, nous aurons le plaisir d'écouter Ilker Fer sur les océans. La deuxième information, c'est que, comme vous le savez, tous les soirs à partir de 17h30, il y a des animations dans le hall d'entrée faite par le Scienscope, donc l'équipe de l'Université de Genève euh, qui vulgarise euh, le, la science. Et la troisième information, et vous avez des images ici, c'est la tenue du spectacle sans lumière, comme chaque soir, entre euh, 18h30, 19h30 et 20h30, ça dure 20 minutes. Cette année, c'est au Musée d'art et d'histoire, pas au Parc des Bastions comme les autres années, au Musée d'art et d'histoire, ça dure 20 minutes jusqu'au 20 novembre. Allez-y, il paraît que c'est fantastique. Je vous donne rendez-vous demain soir et je vous souhaite une très belle soirée. Merci.